Welcome to Marking. I'm Kenneth Allen, and I serve as pastor at St. Michael Lutheran Church. And our topic today is war and Christian perspective toward war. And my guest is Dr. Rudolf Siebert from Western Michigan University, who does a lot of reflection and uh, thinking, reading, and talking about this subject. And uh, I need to say also that uh, he was involved in World War II uh, as a, a German pilot trying to defend uh, the, uh, the cities against some of the firebombing that went on by the Allied planes. So he comes to us as a person who not only thinks about war, uh, but who has experienced war firsthand. So welcome to the program, Rudy. Nice to have you here. And maybe to get started, uh, as we find ourselves as a country embroiled in a war uh, in the Gulf, and we find people protesting that war and praying for peace and uh, other people uh, obviously supporting this kind of effort, maybe we can get started by saying something about a Christian perspective of war. What, what, what has been the past kind of pretty much for Christians as they met with this whole business of war and military service and that yeah. sort of thing. Okay. Maybe uh, we just start out, you know, from the, uh, from the situation in which we well, are now. Because we'll I think, too. yeah, I think it is a very serious situation. You know, we have a tremendous uh, national debt. And when we look at the hardware, that is what we borrowed the money for. One million dollars every time one of those exactly, Patriot missiles exactly, is fired. Yes. Then we have a deep depression at this time, and then on top of it, we have, uh, we have this war, which is obviously very costly, not only the one million dollars, there are, let's see, the Abraham tanks, you know, is about four and a half million dollars, each of them, and the average airplane is about 76 million dollars, and um, this is just the money side. I heard a figure, something like one billion dollars a day. Could be, the war yes, right, us. exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, that should not overshadow, of course, the worst of all, and that is the human casualties if you think of our pilots who have already been shut down yes. and then uh, the UN has heard something about hundreds of dead uh, civilian casualties in Iraq in perhaps Baghdad and yes yes, yes all mm -hmm. over the place so um, that means that people are dying out there and they are wounded and so on at the same time of course through the embargo no medicine has come in so the hospitals there cannot treat you know the wounded adequately and so on no. so this is all uh, of course a very horrible type of situation but um, I think uh, this has happened to us now in a certain sense, and we say every day on television we have no choice or so. But um, maybe we did have a choice at a certain point. And I would say that to some extent, of course, this war and this depression and this national debt has something to do with the uh, 10 years of neoconservatism, of course. All countries who are fighting now are capitalistic countries, and they are all under neoconservative leadership. Yes. The United States, Canada, uh, England, Israel, and so on, and all the others. Well, we so certainly stockpiled a lot of armaments and yeah. developed a lot during yeah. the 80s, I think. That's it right. Sophisticated. Yeah. But thing. behind that, there was a philosophy, you see. Yes. It was not simply arbitrary. It was Reagan and Nixon and so on. It was a philosophy which is called uh, neoconservatism, which uh, we should maybe define, you know, what was behind be all helpful. this. Neoconservatism is an attempt to uh, cancel the uh, cultural uh, modernization, that means the so-called enlightenment movements, mm -hmm. bourgeois enlightenment, Marxist enlightenment, Freudian enlightenment, and, so and at the same time to let the economic modernization go on, yes. the capitalistic modernization, and then, and that's interesting for us, uh, to replace the cultural modernization by pre-modern religious worldviews, be it uh, Taoism or be it uh, Christianity or Hinduism or whatever, or whatever, yes, whatever it could be anything. in order to, uh, to legitimate, you know, the, uh, the economic modernization and to motivate people to participate in it. Yes. So it is this uh, neoconservatism which was very powerful in the government, in the economy, and even on the universities and even in the churches yes. uh, to some extent. Yeah. And this uh, type of philosophy without any real alternative so that people who wanted to introduce in the last 10 years, after the neoconservative trend turn, wanted yeah. to introduce some alternatives. It was very often in the university, at least I experienced it, uh, it was repressed and uh, uh, co critical courses were repressed, critical research was repressed and so on. So the present situation, you see, is the result of, this of at least 10 years of this type of philosophy without any alternative and penetrating the whole of society the economic subsystem, the political subsystem, and the culture, that means the uh, churches and, and, and the universities. So I think that is very important, that we didn't get here 
suddenly just and just overnight. falling out of the, yeah. the sky or so, but that there was a long preparation uh, I of see. this. And, uh, and when we listen to it all day long, you know, and people say, we have no choice, we have to do this and we have to do this, this is true for the moment. But we should not forget that this is all mediated by previous decisions yes. and thoughts and thinking yes. and so on. So yeah. that part is here, you see. And uh, if we want to get out of the situation, I think we have to take this prehistory very seriously. So this, I, I wanted to say this in order to clarify this very costly, costly situation yes. in terms, A, of human life, and then B, in terms of, of money. And, and money means work, you see. It's our work which right. is represented and which goes up. With oh, war is all, always costly. We think of World War II. What, yeah. a, what a cost that was, you yeah, know, right, and yeah. what a loss it was for, yeah, for right. so many people on, on either side of uh, yeah. destruction of property and, and loss of life and That's so right, forth. Yeah. Now, it, it, it seems to me that as I look at Christianity in general, maybe, you know, Christianity in general, at least in this country, seems to be kind of tuned into the culture yeah. uh, and maybe accepting of the culture. So therefore, uh, right now, we uh, you know, have a lot of Christians, I would suppose, who are maybe supportive of this effort uh, in the Gulf. Where does this kind of uh, uh, support and, uh, for war and maybe the acceptance of military service and so forth, it, it, does this go far back into Christianity? Yeah. Uh, is, is it does go far back. Yeah, but before we say that, we should uh, appreciate, you know, that the bishop, uh, at least the representative of the American Bishops' Conference, did say something against this war, that it could yes. not be just. The Pope did write a letter to, uh, to our government, uh, to Bush, even a day or two before the war started. He never received an answer. So um, we should uh, not underestimate, you know, the, uh, the work which was done in order to prevent this. Yes. Uh, uh, there were, even in Congress, you know, there was a representative who, who quoted the Sermon on the Mount, you see, against the war, you see. Well, I remember uh, the debate in the Senate, for right. example, and Foley, uh, was what, 51 to 47 or yeah. something to do this, and that's, yeah. that's no, by no means a mandate. Right, but I mean, what I want to say is there were not all religious people were yes. uh, wanted that what has happened now. I see. Uh, for instance, the Speaker of the House, Foley, you know, said, I come from a tradition where we pray privately, but I would like to ask the House now to pray, and, and he prayed in public. So, um, I mean, uh, religion did play a role right. in, in terms of bringing us to, to reason in a certain sense, but mm -hmm. we have to think, you know, that uh, the majority of our society is secularized, you see, without yes. doubt. So uh, that means the foundations of Christianity have been tremendously weakened. Oh, yeah. uh, if we would ask people, for instance, the Ten Commandments, I don't think there are too many could right. tell us. And if we would ask about the five, uh, the five commandments of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, we would even I get less. I don't think we so, would get that either. <laughs> right. And so if one doesn't know very much about it anymore, it uh, cannot be so effective as we maybe wish it to be. To right? be. And so <clears throat> we have to take that secularization serious. That means most of our people think scientifically today, see. you see. And that means the military science, and that means uh, the political science, and anthropology, and all this scientific outlook, you know, And which economics, is, uh, I suppose, economics, economics yes. sure. And so, and there is no, in, in this type of a, a completely secular worldview, you see, there is no uh, transcendence any longer to which we could refer, a transcendence which would give us sovereignty so that we could step back from these pressures and mm -hmm. say, no, I don't do it, also, the pressures which come from inside, our own aggressiveness, our own yes. death drive, you see. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that without this transcendence, which the sciences cannot provide for us, no. there is no inner freedom, no inner uh, sovereignty uh, uh, through which we could resist the outside pressures toward war and also our inner pressures toward that war because we have these aggressive components yes. in us, you yes. see, yeah. which can very well be mobilized by propaganda and so on. Well, so we should take this, this secular side, I mean, we must take this secular side of a generally scientified and technologized type of a culture mm -hmm. um, where our economic system, see, does not run over Christian norms or so. No. It runs over the medium of money. And our political order runs over the medium of power. Correct. And in both cases, you know, we think very functionally, instrumentally and so on, but we didn't, don't think ethically. No. Th that is maybe a decoration on the cake, you know. But when we, uh, when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when we have to make real decisions, then we think in terms of functional requirements 
of the state of the economy, we don't think in terms of the Sermon on the Mount. No. So therefore, I mean, we have to estimate our troops uh, as religious people uh, and say, you know, how much do we still have on our side in, in an overall secular culture, right? Yeah. And then uh, I would say, of course, that we have a right as citizens to introduce, besides these um, secular uh, perspectives, which have to be taken very seriously, to bring in our religious, religious perspective, in, in perspective. which we have competence, you know. Ah. We are not exactly competent uh, no. military scientists. No. So. No. In the history of Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, has Christianity basically, uh, or uh, much of, uh, many Christians uh, historically been involved in, well, we know they were, through the Crusades, the yeah. Middle Ages, oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned something in your conversation as you were talking now mm -hmm. about just, you know, being, you know, we hear that, the just war theory or okay. just war. Maybe you could explain that to yeah. our okay. audience in right. terms of what do we mean when we say yeah. a just war? Right. Let me start out with something. Uh, on, on Sunday morning, I, I, I give a course to the uh, First Methodist Church uh, about war and peace and, and so on. And so I walked a little bit in the park as I usually do, and there I saw a cannon, a cannon which in our central park down there, yeah. a cannon which remembers uh, two wars, namely the Civil War and then the, um, the Mexican, American-Mexican War. I see. So I went around the cannon, and you know what I saw? In the barrel of, a ca of the cannon was a manger, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Really? Yes. <laughs> <You mean> someone <laughs> had placed that there. Well, well it obviously. was there. There was even a glass. It was covered by a glass. It is supposed to be there. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> and I think if I would take it out, the police would come. So, but I mean, this is a good symbol for what has happened, you see. The manger, uh, Jesus, you know, and peace, of people on earth is in the barrel of a cannon. I mean, you cannot get more perverse than this, you no. see. So we have to ask ourselves, uh, what has happened, you see, that the founder of Christianity, the, who had his inaugural dis uh, 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 discussion, is the Sermon on the Mount, from him into the barrel of a cannon, yes. on, in the center of, of the Kalamazoo, with all the churches standing around, you see? Yes. This is strange. Very incongruous. So that means we would have to think about this strangeness, how this came about. And one has to start from the beginning, you know. I mean, what did the Jew Jesus of Nazareth really think about these issues? I think that is a decent Christian question, you know. Mm -hmm. Not what did Augustine say, not that what the Pope says, what, did, what they s said in Wittenberg, but we have to ask what did they say uh, near Capernaum, that is where the hill is, where Jesus yes, is supposed to have preached the Sermon, on, sermon the Mount, on the Mount. Yeah. And uh, we know it isn't a Sermon on the Mount, many of them, many discourses, yeah, and yeah. so on. But um, we don't have to go into higher criticism. No, we can stay with no, lower criticism. No. And so, um, uh, nevertheless, now, uh, I mean, Jesus is the man who suffered and died for everything what suffers and dies in nature and history. He could not ha keep himself back avariciously, but had to give himself in, in, in terms of non-possessive love. Now from there, uh, of course, uh, how does this, how does this yeah. manger get into this canon? You know, yeah. <laughs> that is the question. I, I, so, I, I, and, and in the first centuries, I would say in the first 300 centuries, uh, in the th first three centuries, um, Christians were all, or most of them, I would almost say all, were conscientious objectors. You wouldn't find many then in military I service. No, you know. as a matter of fact, I think that, you know, it was not, one big church or so. There no, were many, many I'm communities. Sure. And I would say that most of the communities around the Mediterranean did not take soldiers into, into their circles. Oh, is that right? right? Yes. I think I I'm, I'm absolutely sure okay. of this. And that it took a tremendous amount of struggles uh, finally, you know, to relax this. But I would assume they would take in soldiers as they might take in tax collectors, as well, they might take they in... Well, if they stopped to be soldiers. I see, I yeah. see. Okay. I mean, not active soldiers. I see. So. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, there were struggles, you know, finally, as the church became bigger and came closer to the state and so on, then, of course, to bring soldiers in. And I think that the real turn came with the so-called Constantinian trend turn. And you know that this happened in the war, by the way, from the very start, mm -hmm. because according to the court bishop, Eusebius, um, Constantine came, according to legend, Constantine came from the Alps in order to conquer Rome, you see. Yes. And on the way, he saw the cross. The big in, sign. In the disc. Yes. The disc was the uh, symbol of us. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. who was one of the spirits around Ahura Mazda of Zoroastrianism in nice. India, in Iran, you see. That was the Iranian mm -hmm. religion. You know that it was, it was an Aryan, yes. yeah, yeah. Aryan religion, mm -hmm. which was overrun by a Semitic religion, by Islam, of course. Mm -hmm. And so, nevertheless, he saw this, and underneath there was written, uh, in this sign you will conquer. In the sign of the cross, in there you see, it becomes fishy already. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, then he did this. <laughs> he, he put that sign of the cross now, after 300 years of persecution of Christians and so on. As a matter of fact, Diocletian had just, you know, a few years before still yeah, made yes, the last... Yeah, uh, a pretty stiff uh, one. The, yes, the, the, the persecution right, in, in 304, yes. the last persecution, you know, of the Christians. It, had, it has, was just 20 years before mm -hmm. that. So then he put that cross on the flags of his troops and marched over the Million Bridge in, in the morning and conquered Rome they and well. draw the fantastic conclusion, you know, that the god of Christianity was more powerful than Vitras or than Ahura Mazda. It was on this basis that the Constantinian trend turn came about. It was a war in which it happened. Isn't that the interesting? The god of Christianity, yes, ironical. The god of Christianity, you see, and, and then, of course, you know... Christianity Const became legalized then, correct? Yes, it became a yes. state religion. Yes. The bishops, like our down here, yes. ours, uh, became elevated to the senatorial rank. Since that time, he walks around in the pluviale, the raincoat mm -hmm. and the golden sandals sometimes, and so on. Uh, that means uh, Constantine uh, went into, uh, into a maneuver and try to bring the church, which was a low-class church still, up That's and true. bind it, you know, to the, to the state authority, uh, as uh, we call that today, in order to fulfill the function of social integration, you know. I see. By the way, he didn't let himself be baptized. In the Not until his dying thought. day, right? That's right, yes. because the institution of confession and so on, which is the most vacillating one, had not been developed adequately. So if you murdered or you were, uh, idol were engaged in idolatry or in, in, in fornication or whatever, three, three mortal sins, yes. then your baptismal grace would go forever. So, so best to therefore you that wa waited business. until there was no chance <laughs> of doing any, any of these of three things, things anymore. Yeah. And of course, Constantine had good reasons because you know he became suspicious about his wife and his son because of incest and he killed them both. Oh, so not to speak of other uh, military activities. So. Um, Nevertheless, he was later on, uh, he was baptized, but not by a Roman Catholic no. bishop, but he was baptized by an Arian. I see. And, and the Arians are left over in the, in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. How they, they went, all went under with the West Gothian uh, tribes, yes. but they suddenly uh, appeared again in Pittsburgh, you know, in the last century, yes. in the Jehovah's Witnesses. So, nevertheless, uh, that is how it happened, you see. So I then mean, once, the state, once the state and the church were wed, then I suppose... Yeah you were expected to yeah. be a yes. part of... And then also the theory the changed in the church, you see? Yes. Praxis first, action first, and then theory secondly. Correct. That means after the church now had become a bedfellow of the state, um, up to today I would say we are very much, if you, if you leave out the cults and the sects, uh, I would say the other churches are very much Constantinian churches still, yeah. and that in spite of the separation of the church and the state, you know, there is still mm -hmm. this bedfellow. Stuff oh, going sure. on up to oh, sure. and no matter you know how how different we are in terms of the interpretation of reality or orientation of yes. action and dogma and so on, you know we all have the flag uh, on the side of the altar, and that means if we are called upon to uh, do the integrative no, job, we, we will uh, all come. We don't fly the flag in our congregation. You, in don't, our you don't have it standing there. No, oh, no, we don't no. have any flags. Yeah, an no, we, we, okay. we, yeah. we got rid of that uh, quite a while ago. Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> we felt that okay. uh, it wasn't so, appropriate yeah, for so a house have, of worship. You have broken with the Constantinian uh, tradition. I, I guess so. Yes. In that okay. respect, we have, but Very not good, certainly yeah. in other yeah. respects. But uh, I mean, it's. Well, so they, that out of this then came yeah. the business of the just war theory that's been kind of holding sway with well, many Christians, yeah. churches, not, and not maybe kind of halfway civilized governments? Yeah. Uh, not right away. No, you know, not right because, away? Uh, because there was a great, and that we should say in the honor of the whole tradition, there was a great resistance in the name of Jesus of Nazareth against all this. I mean, and this was always there, and it's there today. Yes, you know? So yes. we should never forget, you know, this uh, non-identity in this whole movement. That means there were always people who went on to, to resist it. So, but in the more now, you see, people who had been Roman administrators, like the Bishop of uh, Milano, for instance, uh, Ambrosius, you know, were yeah. then voted by the people also to be bishops. Yes, now, was, suddenly, yeah. uh, you know, the whole issue of power came into the church. As a matter of fact, uh, there were things which happened before. Uh, the uh, Elvira, the Bishop of Elvira, for instance, uh, wanted to sit, you know, one step higher than his people. You oh, know. is that right? Yes, uh, already before Constantine, sure. you see. So his parish wrote to the emperor and said, only you are allowed to sit one step higher, oh. you see. 
And so the emperor wrote back, Bishop, you have to go down again to all the other people. Now today, the bishop sits three or four steps. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, these developments, you see, of uh, uh, that Jesus thought, you know, that his community would not be of this world. But it became more and more of this, of this world, world in terms of ranking, in terms of power, in terms of wealth, and so on. Yes. And uh, uh, secondly is then this theoretical stuff, you mm -hmm. see, where people then try to adjust their theology yes. to what has happened. And this is Augustine now, Irenaeus mm -hmm. too, but take, let's take Augustine, you know, yeah. because there's something very peculiar happened. Augustine suddenly began to charge all people who said that war was entirely evil, yes. and that's what most people said in Christianity. He charged them with the Manichaic heresy. They were suddenly all Manichaean. The irony is that Augustine, as you know, was a Manichaean himself yes, for he eight was. years. Yes. When uh, he was split, as Manichaeanism means that, mm -hmm. that there is spirit, which is beautifully f fewer, yes. and then there is the animal on the other side, you mm -hmm. see. Which, and so you can satisfy them both. On one side, uh, Augustine was uh, a professor of rhetoric, you know, and uh, in, so in Milano. And on the other side, he had a concubine whose name we have never uh, heard. Right? He forgot that. I will mm -hmm. never forget that. As mm -hmm. If we mm -hmm. meet in heaven, Augustine, uh, and we, we would like we to ask him about that. Yes, about this, yes, yes. yes. He, uh, he mentioned his son, Adeodatus, uh, you know, whom he got from God, that means given by God, yes. through the concubine, mm -hmm. and he remembered his name. He died very early in his 20s. And so. But this same, uh, later on, uh, Augustine converted back to Catholicism because he waited for the Manichaean bishop to come. Uh, and, and when the bishop came, he was so stupid that Augustine did not like it anymore, the whole thing, and left Manichaeism and so on. So after this, then, now he charges all these people who say war is it's not evil. entirely evil, or war is yeah. evil, war is evil, yeah. uh, with heresy. And his position now is, and that becomes the position of everybody afterwards, because well, he had what a an tremendous, impact he had, he had on the Western Church. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Adam, for 600 years, father. 600 years, people read nothing else than Augustine. Yeah. So, um, and that means now his new thesis is that war is not entirely bad. And so war is not entirely bad means it, it can be used in order to protect the innocent. And he thought particularly of the merchants in Rome against the Vandals and so on. You know that Augustine became a victim of war himself in the end. Mm -hmm. You know, he became mm -hmm. a victim of his own theory. In yes. a yeah. So, um, but then... People from then on, you know, they found all kinds of good reasons why one could make war. Economic reasons, stock market went up recently, you see. Oh, see and right. then, of course, um, reasons that we get better technology, sometimes we get better medicine, uh, young people learn discipline, and so on. So you have a whole, right, why then war is not entirely Well, we bad, can put someone see. in their place, mm -hmm. we can kick some butt, you yeah, know, right. or whatever yeah. the or case is. We can establish world justice and, and, and whatever, yeah. Right. Or establish. That is how it happened. I mean, Augustine, whom we have, we have Augustine Church down there, and, yes. and of course Augustine sits up and there. Have, you see him standing Ambrose, up there? Yes, yeah. Augustine, yes. Yeah. Uh, but he's white up there, he's black really, he was an African, as you know, so yes. we should paint him black someday. Yes, we should. Yes, we should, I know. It's interesting, in this town that we've got those three in this scenario, yeah. We have Monica, the yeah, mother, right, his mother, and yeah. we have uh, Ambrose, right. the yes. bishop, who right. I think was instrumental in uh, helping right. yeah. uh, Augustine come yeah. to Christianity, yeah. you know, and Augustine himself. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, on Sunday somebody made some kind of a joke. He wrote on St. Augustine Parish doors, you ought not to kill, or you should not kill. Um, right underneath St. Augustine. So there's always somebody, you know, who reminds St. Augustine that maybe with his theory something was not entirely kosher, you know. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Well, there have been some groups within Christianity that uh, have been traditionally pacifists, uh, yeah. aren't there? And not only in modernity, because, uh, you know, the whole monk, uh, the monasticism, you know, uh, when the church uh, suddenly became mainstream and therefore had soldiers and participated in war and so on, then, of course, the monks left the mainstream and went into the desert and so on, because we have Benedict and yeah. so on, oh, yes. see? Oh, yes. And so um, they took the vows, um, the vow of uh, chastity and the vow of poverty and the vow of obedience, which is directed, of course, against power, against wealth, you know, and against marriage. Oh, all and so. of that stuff. And uh, uh, because, you see, the, uh, uh, they, they based their whole life, of course, on the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, they knew that all the uh, uh, Beatitudes, for instance, you know, with which the Sermon on the Mount yeah. begins, that they hang together. So, yeah. <clears throat> blessed are the peacemakers, because they will, shall be called uh, sons of God. But you have to have another Beatitude, namely, blessed are those who are pure of heart, um, because they see God. That yes. means if you are not pure of heart, that means if you are addicted to power, uh, to money, to stocks, and not to see that opportunity or to sex or whatever, yeah. then you don't see God. 
-hmm. And if you don't see God, you see, you will also not resist war, which is fed by these things, by power and money mm -hmm. and so on. And then you will not be the son of God neither. Yeah. So um, that is what the monks uh, did. Right. And uh, they went out in three rivers, you know, we have the Anglican monks. Yes, there and is some. one down there. Yeah. Yes, so yeah. We, uh, yeah. And, and there, are, there are Protestant monks, Catholic monks. How do, monks. how do the other scriptures uh, 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 play on this, Rudy, with regard to a Christian responsibility in the context of a society. For example, uh, uh, Jesus himself says, you know, render to Caesar that which is Caesar, yeah. and to God the things which are God. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Paul in Romans 13 mm -hmm. talks about the presence of the government as, mm -hmm. as God's yeah. agent, and the government has yeah. the uh, a thing to, uh, you know, use force if yeah. necessary, I guess. He can yeah. unsheath that sword. Yeah, the whole or true, that uh, the government, you know, exists theory, for the... You know. uh, for the, yeah, for the protection of those who do right, right and for the yeah. punishment of those who do wrong. Yeah. Uh, 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 can it, uh, could it be that sometimes, uh, you know, not sometimes, all the times we are living in a world that's obviously less than ideal. Mm -hmm. And we have our ideals and we have the word of our Lord, mm -hmm. but can there, can there be a time where, uh, do you think there can be a time where a Christian can serve in the military no. or participate in a war that force can be legitimately used? Mm. Well, uh, the question is now, <laughs> if you ask Jesus or St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, I, I guess, you know, yeah. they have slight differences with each other, you see. And maybe we and see then, even some differences between Jesus, Paul, and obviously in the yeah, book of Revelation yeah. where the government becomes a beast because yeah, it's, okay, uh, yeah. you know... Well, you would have to say between John, you know, and Jesus. We don't know if they were cousins. It doesn't matter very yeah, much. Yeah. Obviously, you know, John was more radical than Jesus in a yeah, certain sense. Yeah. Uh, that's why he died earlier, you know. The more radical you are, the earlier you die. I suppose. And, um, and then, of course, uh, sentences not like you, you know, give to the emperor and so on, or mm -hmm. that you will have the poor always with us, which are fundamentalists, you know, yeah, right wingers always bring the into the social, forefront. Yeah. But, uh, then we would have to bring higher criticism in anyway and would have to yeah. ask, you know, yeah. if you may remove the eschatological reservation from thing from, from mm -hmm. the Gospels, you yes. see, then you get a completely different picture. That's true. If true. you say, you know, the, the kingdom is away one generation or so, and yes. then you say then you have different. the poor always with you, yes. that always means one yeah. generation, you see. Yes. But if it doesn't come, then of yeah. course it means 2,000 years. This so. has been a very interesting conversation, and I think we're going to plan to do this next week again yes, and continue very good. it. And I'm very, very thrilled about, about that. So okay. thank you very much for You're being welcome. on the program, Dr. Siebert. And on behalf of uh, uh, your fellow Lutheran Church, we are glad that you tuned in to Markings and hope to see you again next week when Dr. Siebert will be back and myself to discuss perspective, Christian perspective, and the reality of war.